Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome uh, and thank you for joining um, uh, today in Green Week, Trinity's Green Week, uh, for our latest Climate Action and Sustainability Lunchtime uh, Lecture as part of the webinar series. Um, I hope uh, if you've enjoyed the series so far. For those of you who are continuing with us and for those joining today, maybe for the first time, that you, you can catch up with old ones. We've recorded all our sessions via the Trinity YouTube channel and indeed um, can participate and join us for future sessions. Um, so um, my name is John Gallagher. I'm, I'm coordinating the series. For those of you who have been joining, we're now in part two. We're actually uh, hitting the halfway point today in, in the series, number six of 12, where we're giving kind of, um, I suppose, sharing um, some of our academic expertise from across the university and their knowledge and expertise around the different facets of climate action and sustainability and how different academics are approaching and, and addressing those national and global challenges. Um, just, uh, I, I think our speaker today will have this maybe element in the slide if I haven't seen it, I think, I think I've seen this, just kind of contextualizing where we're at in terms of national priorities and perhaps as well, just referring to maybe SDGs around either link, uh, work links to specific ones. I think our speaker last week, Jane Stout, mentioned that her work addresses all of them. So it's a, a, a the, the benchmark has been set for, for trying to, to address them um, uh, uh, effectively. And uh, it's my great pleasure today to um, welcome our speaker for today, uh, Professor Mick Morris, who's the director of AMBER Research, SFI Research Center for um, Advanced Materials. And um, I think, Mick, your title might be a little bit different, but um, uh, it, it really comes down to um, addressing sustainability and, and the, the role of circular economy within that. Um, so it's my great pleasure to um, hand over to the speaker today. You're all welcome to uh, add questions throughout the session, uh, as Mick's just going to upload his slides now for sharing. Please do add your questions to the Q&A tab or the chat tab. But also um, raise your hand as well. You're more than welcome to. We'll invite you to ask your question directly to Mick um, later in the session. So, um, Mick, um, I don't know if you're okay there. Starting to share now. That's perfect. I can see that. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you, Mick. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John. I'll just uh, keep an eye on my watch, and I'll I'll try to keep within the thirty minutes. Um. Yeah, the talk's slightly different, but uh, kind of same perspective around looking at the circular economy and trying to assess whether we understand it. And if it's so good, why is uh, why is it taking so long to appear? Um, as John said, I'm uh, the AMBA Director in the School of Chemistry. Um, I've kept the chemistry at a bare minimum um, for a mixed audience. Uh, so I'll, uh, yeah, hopefully it will work. Um, let's check whether I can advance the screen. Um, as John said, um, I haven't given a consideration of what the circular economy is uh, and how it can affect some of our national priorities. Uh, clearly, it really focuses on greening business and enterprise, or at least what I'm going to talk about. Um, there is obviously a, a, a social element, a, a kind of general public element of the circular economy, uh, which I don't really think about it too much in terms of this talk. Um, but clearly the social uptake of the concept of being more circular is important. And then the other thing which it can really affect is uh, building better, and uh, you might have seen within the new circular economy action plan and um, that there is provision um, as one of the government targets to build a circular building. So uh, they're the two features of national policy that it, it really uh, impacts. I did want to give the scale of um, exactly how difficult the challenge can be. And, uh, it's, it's important to realize, I guess, even before we start talking about the circular economy, 
the sort of things that it contributes to, because uh, it's not always entirely obvious. Uh, but if we look at in 2021, which is the last full set of figures, um, if you look at our kind of imports and exports, and so this is a, a job I'm kind of doing at the moment, uh, a project using import and export figures to estimate how much carbon, how much plastic we use in the country. Then you come up with some pretty um, alarming figures. In terms of oil, we imported around 30 million tons, um, around four and a half million tons of gas, um, two million tons of plastics. And I'm gonna center this talk around plastics as a suitable example, and about three million tons of chemicals. And if you add those up in terms of their uh, carbon footprint, they make up, those imports make up about 80% of all the uh, our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's really why it's centered on um, uh, the private area, the business, the commercial area, in terms of trying to understand circularity, um, because it's really not driven by the general public. Um, we know where our energy comes from. Um, we still, right, so again, this is uh, 2022 figures. We still largely re rely on oil and gas for our energy needs. Our renewable element is about 13%. About 10 of that is domestic. About 3.5% is actually imported and labeled as renewable. Um, it's, I guess it's important as well to set some kind of figures, and I don't want to look at these too much, but um, the bottom left figure, I think, is one to have in mind, which is our kind of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are around 60 million tonnes. And even within um, the accelerated uh, climate plans of the government, that is only going to drop to 50 in terms of uh, our net zero targets. And as we saw from um, IPCC uh, on Monday, they want those targets accelerated still further to meet the one and a half degree limit. And they also want to cut the CO2 emissions below uh, the net zero value. So really challenging. Um, I think the first thing that I want to explore is why I guess things like plastics and chemicals really contribute to this. We have a policy uh, within the country of really targeting energy, which is a good target because it's the biggest percentage. Uh, but particularly as we move forward beyond 2030, uh, chemicals, industrial production, and industrial energy play a much more important role at the moment. And I'm not entirely sure whether our strategy is geared towards that. Um, John said, um, Jane said that everything is, uh, all of the SDGs are impacted by uh, uh, biodiversity, et cetera. Well, most of them are impacted by uh, the circular economy. And this is a slide from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation relating the circular economy uh, to some of the SDGs in various ways. So there's ones which have minimum, you have small impacts and ones which have large impacts and they're labeled here, but you can see um, the, the really strong ones are uh, at, at things like renewable energy and good jobs and economic growth. And it's important to stress that the circular economy is really about maintaining uh, sustainable development. It really is focused on an economy. I'm not entirely sure that it is, and it, or it should be. Um, but you can see that it's really important in terms of life on land, the quality of our land. It's important in terms of uh, pollution in our waters, because the whole thing about the circular economy is it drives down all elements of losses and more efficient production. Um, so that's my homework, as uh, John requested. Um, I'm going to come up with some definitions. It's uh, a good, I, I think it's a good place to start because I think when we look at the three definitions that 
are important within the circular economy are probably of critical importance. We all have a different perspective on what they mean. And certainly one of the things that I, I go round and I talk about the circular economy to people all the way from school kids uh, to heads of large organizations, everyone has a slightly diff different definition. Um, the circular economy uh, is defined here. This is a, a, a definition that's arisen out of ISO work on developing standards for the circular economy. It really is an economic system and it focuses on reusing materials and maintaining their value, that twin approach. So it's not about taking plastic from bottles, grinding it up and putting it into road tar, where essentially it's lost from the value chain uh, and it's down cycled rather than the value being maintained. It really is about maintaining the value of materials and products for as long as possible. And through that, allowing sustainable development not necessarily economic development, and that's, that's a really clear point. Okay, so it's an economic system, allows the functioning of our economy while allowing sustainable development. The other definition I think is really useful is itself sustainable development. And what does, what does that mean? It means developing our economy, uh, our social fabric and our environment whilst not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Um, so sustainability at the best is maintaining what we have. Um, sustainability really should be aiming to improve uh, the environmental, the social and the economic system so that we leave the world and the planet in a better place than we, uh, than we, than we started with. Another thing which is often described as, a, as important in terms of the circular economy is a switch from our reliance on uh, synthetic materials made from fossil fuels towards renewable sources and renewable resources, be that energy or materials. Um, and so we really have to focus on the fact that there is a really strict definition about renewable. It isn't just that the thing grows out the ground. It is not just biomass. It's biomass that can be uh, regenerated, and regenerated with improvements or maintaining the land that it comes from or the sea. Um, so it's about improving the quality whilst taking it. So we have to harvest it at the same rate that it grows. And, and that is the real challenge within a circular economy um, that we just don't swap um, extracting resources like oil uh, for, re for extracting biomass type resources and leaving them denuded for future generations. So that really is what the circular economy is about. Um, I have been described as a secular economy zealot. Um, and so uh, we have to kind of put that in perspective um, that it is not a new God. It almost seems that circular economy at the moment in many people's minds is trumping sustainability. And, and that really has to be addressed. The circular economy is a tool for trying to develop a more sustainable future. It isn't the goal, it isn't the target, it's just a simple tool. Um, it's an important tool, probably the most important one that we have, probably the only one that's gonna have a very significant impact. Um, but it, there are others, we can just look at super high efficient processes. Um, but there are alternatives, but it's the circular economy which is really important in delivering a sustainable future for us all. And it's important to look at how circular we are in Ireland. And uh, uh, these are the figures from 2020, and we haven't improved the, uh, the circular, uh, circularity gap report is being published at the moment. Uh, we haven't seen the figures for 23, um, but we haven't improved significantly. Um, so 
in terms of a broad measure of circularity, we uh, had only Romania within uh, the 27 European states and well below the average. So we, we do have an appalling track record of both measuring and implementing circular processes. Um, that's, that, that's the kind of rough math that's coming out in 23. Um, you see, we've improved slightly. So we've, we're second from bottom. Um, and this kind of gives us a, a view from where we are uh, in various aspects of circularity. So pretty poor for food waste. Our recycling rate, uh, which I think is an artificial figure actually, uh, we're about 15th. Um, trade and raw materials, pretty poor. So we, we're not, we don't have one particular weakness in Ireland. We are not circular across the wider board. Um, so where did it all go wrong? When did we become massively uh, non-circular? And I think you have to look at history. And the obvious key event was the Industrial Revolution. Um, and if we pin the blame on the Industrial Revolution to one man, it would be probably John Kay, uh, who invented this flying shuttle, uh, which sounds like a tremendous advice, but basically it was in weaving. Uh, so if we actually look at the spinning jenny, um, you're putting weaves across during the process, that was done by hand and still was after John Kay, but it meant that you could scale up the spinning jenny to be many feet across. And that was done with, with this spinning jenny, which was nothing more than thrown by two young workers from one end of the loom to the other, <laughs> pardon, carrying the, uh, the yarn as it become a, uh, as those devices become more sophisticated, it actually uh, got wheels on and uh, you could shuttle it quite fast and then it became automated. But at that, that kind of invention released the industrial revolution in its concept because it allowed cloth to be made cheaper, more effectively and distributed. And what the, what, what the, what that that did is it disconnected most of the population from both waste, what you do when something wants to be thrown away, and also extraction and use and manufacturing. So we became commoditized. And of course, then what business did is developed the, the models and the practices to sell us as consumers, as many products as they could, as cheaply as possible. Um, now, I, I, I might have been negative about the Industrial Revolution, but of course that's, that's not true. Um, it was, and it, it happened incredibly quickly. And um, so the top right is a picture of my hometown of Liverpool in about 1780. And it was a sort of an extended village because of the industrial revolution and Liverpool was at the heart of chemical production uh, and cotton production. Um, it expanded into a, a large city within 30 years, the expansion of, of, of uh, the industrial revolution was enormously fast. And much as we might look back and think, yeah, but we're here, we've developed things like mass consumerism, mass production, um, which are negative, they the impact the earth negative. It has huge social benefits. And just to reflect the value of that, that progress, if you look at the average lifetime, it's more than doubled in the last 200 years, which is just incredible progress. So we shouldn't be negative about, about the past, but we should maybe think about what it did and the effects that it had. Okay, so we, we know what the linear economy is. Um, take, make, use, dispose, as illustrated here. Um, we know what the Industrial Revolution did. It made that production more favorable. It allowed transport. Um, it produced a workforce that were disconnected with the countryside. Um, but it led to companies 
developing models which were about sailing and uh, concept in economics is circular money. That what we do is we make things, we sell things, we employ people to make them, we sell more things, we make more money, we employ more people. Um, of course, that concept of just continuing to sell more things to more people in more markets uh, has become ingrained in the whole of society. Because what we can see that if we look at a, a, a different way of viewing it, what government does is A, try to control that money supply, which it can never do effectively through the institutions, through the banks, etc. cetera. Um, but it's the thing that gives us our social protection. So it uses that money uh, to ensure uh, a good workforce, to ensure a reasonable standard of life. And so it's really embedded, government is really embedded with this concept of generating more and more money and the flow of that money. And the circular economy at its heart challenges that view. And we all know what the circular economy is. Um, maybe we know wrong. So top left-hand picture here shows essentially and we see this time and time again, I still see it in, in presentations where we link the circular economy to mitigation of waste through the concept of recycling. And that is not the circular economy as I'll explain in a bit. Uh, a better description of the circular economy is given below where we break out that linear economic model and we introduce things like recycling, but we think more about reuse, remanufacturing, and lifetime. Now, I still don't think that's an accurate representation. And we should really think about the circular economy being heavily focused on extending use cycles. So not only developing multiple uses for materials or use cycles, but maintaining the use through actions like uh, improved design, durability, allowing repair, allowing refurbishment. So that use cycle, that primary use cycle is very extended compared to what we have in the world. Right. We should then focus if we're gonna divert ourselves from producing waste, right? Within a circular economy, there is no concept as waste. There might be end of life where we've taken as much value out as we can, but there's no concept of waste. So we can think about reuse because um, that maintains the, the good, the product in its primary, as its primary function. And then we should think about re remanufacture. It is only at the end of life that we should think about recycle. Um, but that concept of the sake of this of secularity rather than the circular economy really questions the concept of economics and i've just illustrated that right and we all buy these things 60 euro for a printer head cartridge and um, because that's the business model the hp have developed that sells us 20 mils of ink at an enormous price by building a, a whole protected delivery system, which is designed to be disposed of at the end. And absolutely rigid maintenance of that model so that there's a silicon chip in there, which contains all the cryptography, which prevents us from refilling these things. But it, the secular economy really questions that approach as a business model. Um, we, of course, try to uh, include some standards, regulations, and policies to drive a shift towards the circular economy. Uh, but as we've seen, none of them have, have been terribly effective, whether that's in construction, whether that's in waste, or any other process. Um, we can think really about what we should be doing within circularity. So we should be refusing goods, right? So we, we shouldn't be buying as much because they're better designed. We should be reducing our purchases because they live longer. We should be reusing them because they're designed to be reused. They should be designed for repair. So 
a critical concept in the circular economy is design. Things have to be designed, built, sold, manufactured, delivered to maintain a circular economy type approach. We have to think about circularity. And if we think about it in a, in a little bit more detail, so what I've said here is I've assumed circularity is associated with mitigation of waste. As I said before, we still have that concept within the Irish Circular Economy Action Plan. Waste is intimately linked to the circularity. There's very little about design. There's very little about progress. It's all about how we divert things from landfill into, into second and tertiary uses. Um, but if we considered this you know, in terms of essentially a reverse circular economy, based on recycling. Um, you can see that at the end of the disposal phase, we introduce a whole pile of new uh, technology, new processing, which is to do with washing, sorting, uh, separation, et cetera, right? So if you think about all we're doing with the recycling, we're swapping the extraction part of the linear economy for another part which is the sorting. And so really you're looking at the difference in, in terms of carbon dioxide, in terms of the broadest measure of, of sustainability that we have, you're looking at the difference between extraction and recycling in energy, in energy or carbon terms. That, that's all we're doing. So that has kind of limited benefits, but mostly still at the moment, it's the best we can do. Um, I put in a, a, a simple diagram looking at the carbon budget, which is affected by recycling. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about whether these are true figures or not. Um, but if we look at glass, it has apparently quite a low carbon burden to be used now. That kind of goes against um, what you might think because it's made in... Uh, very high temperature furnaces, but that really is its only major, uh, uh, only major carbon burden. Plastic is very much on a kilo basis, much better than glass, uh, much better than paper, much better than cardboard, much better than aluminium, and much better than steel. Its real advantage and why we use so much plastic is that it's carbon burden per unit strength is enormous, right? So there's only plastic that gives us enormous strengths, right? The strengths of metals with a weight density close to water. And that is the real advantage. Um, this is kind of general figure. Um, there is still a big burden. Most people would say that recycling PET, recycling polypropylene is shown here kind of saves half the carbon because um, it's quite an intensive process. You separate it, even in the simplest process, you separate, sort the waste, wash it, clean it. You then grind it. You then wash it again. Uh, you then add things to it to improve its properties, and then you release it back into the market. Um, but it doesn't last forever. So every time you go through a mechanical recycle, loses a, somewhere between five and 10% of its strength and it adds one to 2% of impurities through each cycle. Both of those things that are, are important. So if we think about a Coca-Cola bottle, uh, there are two properties it has to have strength for its lightweight behavior. Uh, density, which is related to the strength to stop it spoiling by uh, either losing carbon dioxide or uh, in, uh, importing uh, uh, importing microbials from outside, and it has to be clear. And once you get up to one to two percent of impurities in an in a recycle, it starts to become foggy, and customers don't like that. Um, should also think that 
recycling isn't uh, a clean job. And it's just a picture of uh, someone from a waste recycling plant in Dublin sorting out the waste into productive streams. Uh, and then it's sold and baled, baled and sold largely externally uh, for companies to then go through a second sorting process to separate it into colors, types of plastic, etc. cetera. So uh, it's not particularly uh, 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 socially friendly uh, technology. And it's not efficient. Um, we currently in the world recycle less than 10% of all plastic. Uh, we don't treat it as a material of value. Um, chemical reprocessing can do things um, where we chemically recycle it uh, that physical recycling can't. So we can't recycle mechanically mixed waste or different plastics. We can't recycle contaminated waste. And we don't even re like recycling plastic from different suppliers. It tends to lead to problems. But chemical recycling uh, can. Uh, and that is a, a, a chemical process which we can then uh, turn into valuable organics, maybe go through a pyrolysis to generate some, uh, some uh, oils, gasify those oils, and then turn them back into the, the original materials that we made the plastic from. Um, and that is a process which is being heavily researched. Um, we must consider. And I think this is the best example I, I've kind of seen. It's from uh, 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 essentially from the OECD. And these are two chemical recycling processes for plastics, uh, which have been considered and are being scaled uh, because the makers, one is B BASF, which I guess everyone has heard of. The other one is Arkema. Uh, which is a very large plastic manufacturing company. And they report that their recycling methods are net carbon zero. Um, and the reason for that is that they specifically don't compare their products, their recycling process, to uh, a plastic which has been uh, fully incinerated to yield carbon dioxide. So the figures are very much distorted by not including that. Now, presumably they're making the same plastics, which will also have to be incinerated eventually, but they haven't counted that on their side of the equation. And when you count that in, there may be two or three more times carbon inefficient than the original plastic. So we have to measure things, but we have to measure things really well and really carefully. Um, this gives us a, a scale of the problem for plastics. Um, this is from an, another OECD report modeling how we're going to use plastics, um, which illustrates A, that somewhere around 2050, we're going to be using over a billion tons of stuff every year. Um, recycling is going to have a very small effect, even by then when we've improved our technology. And the scale of the problem is such that by, uh, that by 2050, plastics alone will account for 17%, somewhere around 17% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So this isn't fine detail as we kind of interpret it at the moment. This is really significant contribution to climate change. And processing is expensive, and I've just compared the price of uh, uh, PT, uh, plastic bottles, plastic beverage bottles, and they're around twice as expensive to buy as virgin PET. And that's because recycling adds price. We could consider glass as an alternative. So if you like going back to the future, um, it's a great material. It's the most circular material we have. Around 95% of glass is recycled in some countries. It's a better packaging material. 
it's customer preferred. Uh, adding recycled glass lowers furnace temperatures, so saves energy. It's chemically and environmentally benign, right? So fantastic material, and it's got a relatively low budget by weight. Of course, it weighs heavy because it fractures by a brittle mechanism. So a glass bottle uh, is up to 15 times thicker than its equivalent plastic. So we're trying to make bottles um, which improve the carbon budget and the price by making them lighter. And uh, the only way to make glass lighter is to make it stronger. Um, so going back to uh, Materials Engineering 101, the only way you can do that is to reduce the number of defects or to decrease their size. And so that's what we've been doing by applying uh, film. I won't really go into how it's done onto the surface. This is uh, on the right. You can see a cross section of the film. Highly perfect, highly defect free, covers all the surface gaps. And on the left, there's some figures there which show that we're getting uh, about twice the strength for a third of the material in a glass bottle. Um, and that will make it both price and carbon competitive with conventional carbon, uh, with conventional plastic. So there are solutions, but they're still recycling solutions. And I think, as I said before, you know, without going into the, the depths of uh, life cycle assessment, you can see that reuse just saves so much carbon dioxide. And if we were allowed to reuse glass bottles, we could take 3% off the world's carbon emissions straight away. But we're not allowed to anymore uh, because of health regulations. Um, just to finish on plastics from an Irish point of view, um, the only thing we recycle is packaging waste, plastic packaging waste, and we do very little of that in the country. Only about of the 308,000 tons of plastic packaging waste we, we develop, we recycle about 7,500 tons. And what we don't have, and why a circular economy doesn't work properly, is that we don't know how to count value. So we can count economic factors like, and that's why people buy virgin PET because it's cheaper than recycled. But we don't know how to count the economic values, et cetera. So that, that's a, a real challenge, I think, to the incorporation of a circular economy. We need measures and they can be incredibly difficult. So this kind of shows the kind of information that you'd need to measure or express the circularity of plastic bottle or container bottle reduction. And so these are all the things with the little box that you need to measure, the amount of energy, the amount of water, the amount of renewables in it, the amount of virgin material, the amount of recycled material. And then we have to look at all the outflows all the emissions, all the losses, how much of it is downcycled, how much of it is recycled. Um, and so there isn't one figure. You can't say My, this plastic bottle is 20% circular. It can only be analyzed when all that information is properly reported. So how we measure circularity is still a challenge and still under development. Um, I won't necessarily talk about this, but I'll just finish up just to uh, stop John worrying um, there's potentially enormous benefits in enabling a circular economy. Um, it can clearly contribute and will have to contribute to climate change. It can disconnect us from reliance on fossil fuel if we you know, took plastics out the ground and we kept them in very long use cycles, we'd be happy, right? <laughs> you know, if we, we didn't have to take out very much fossil fuel to make plastics, that's a win. Um, there is a challenge. Uh, if we want to look in Ireland um, and we want to remove 6 million tons, right? So 2 million tons of plastic is equivalent to 6 million tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we need two to three times more than the available biomass in the country if we were going to make our own plas plastics. 
if we've got a circular economy, we can actually grow more fuel that we're not diverting that into the bioeconomy in terms of the, the technosphere. We can reduce energy demands. Recycling obviously leads to new jobs in circular economy and local jobs. And it's the only tractable solution that I would put in, I would say. So why not? Why hasn't it appeared? Well, the answer's kind of in a couple of the things that I've said. We have an economy that is totally built around linear economic models. And we also have an economy which is built on very complex supply chains. And so each one of those companies associated with, it, with making a plastic bottle, the transport, the chemicals, the oil companies, all would have to exchange information. And again, we, we have an economy where companies aren't good at sharing information or resources. So the, producing a circular economy, uh, there is an enormous weight of force against it. Okay, what do we need? We can look at the governance gaps. There's huge finance required if we're gonna drive it, huge infrastructure, uh, huge changes in practice. We don't have the regulation. We don't have the policy. Um, people really aren't aware of the damage or the size of the challenge that we have. Um, and there's a lack, right? Even from the very brief technical pieces I've told you, there's a lack of technologies that are out there to solve some of the problems. We need lots of things. We need proper data assessment. Uh, we need financing and huge amounts of financing. We need proper regulation. We need the social vision to get it. So we have enormous challenges in delivering this. What the circular economy can't be uh, is an extension of the current situation. And one of the things that's being talked about is that we can have a perfectly circular economy maintaining current economic practices using uh, carbon dioxide fixation, industrial carbon dioxide fixation. And we take the carbon dioxide, we make it into either chemicals or synthesis gas, which we can then use make chemicals. And those chemicals include plastics, they include oils, right? that little bit olefins, right? And we can just carry on regardless because all that happens is we use them, we pump carbon dioxide into the air, and then we, uh, we take back out the air and we're not doing any harm to the environment. So at the center of these plans for through circularity and inverted, common, common, uh, in, in inverted commas is direct air conversion plants where we just take suck CO2 out the air out the air but we kind of have to think about exactly what we're doing we're not changing anything this can't possibly be circular in the best sense of the world and i did a very rough calculation um that to make one million tons of methanol right so that's kind of bare minimum that we'd need in ireland if we were going to be self-sufficient in chemicals and um, it would take 11 terawatts of energy, presumably from hydrogen, right? So if we think about the challenges for the hydrogen economy, we heard a little bit about it last week, um, just simply fulfilling a fraction of our plastic need would take the energy uh, to drive the whole country. Um, and we're still left with top right is uh, where I used to work for ICI in uh, Runcorn, biggest chemical, uh, plant in the world um, and clearly very damaging in terms of the environment. So we're still going to have that environmental damage as well as soaking up huge amounts of energy. Um, we also don't have direct air, air plants. Um, even in the most favorable circumstances, um, we'd be literally absorbing about a thousand million tons of uh, CO2 by 2050, um, which is equivalent to the weight of polymer that we'll be making. So we're not really doing anything truly circular here. Um, and where are we with that technology? 
Um, Iceland currently has the biggest uh, DAC plant in the world. About 4,000 tonnes of CO2 are absorbed ev in every hour. In Ireland, to be match our emissions, we'd need 15,000 of these. Now, that's unfair because that, that's going to take us to net true zero carbon. But if we want to meet our uh, 2050 net zero goals, we need about 1,000 of those plants at a minimum. And they, that would cost the country somewhere between 300 to $600 billion. And I'll finish that slide because it essentially makes the point that I've been trying to make it all along is circularity is not business as usual. It will really take a completely different revision of our economy for circularity to make a true difference. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you very much, Mick. Um, some very, very strong points, but I think they, they're, they're, it's the reality, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, again, thanks to everyone for joining, and I think everyone really enjoyed the the, the presentation and and indeed the Q&A for your further insights. Um, as always, this is uh, just to promote, I suppose, you know, this is one element of what Trinity do in terms of research and education, make, make contributes to a range of programs and uh, includes um, a program run by Professor Yuri Gunko, who's next week's speaker. Um, again, continuing the narrative of circular economy but i think within climate action and sustainability it's a topic that needs to be addressed as today's talk highlighted there's a lot of work needed to be done to ensure that climate action and circular economy um their the principles are are aligned moving forward so i hope you can join us for next week and in, in yuri's talk um uh, on advanced emerging materials uh so as always we'll be sharing a recording um, of the session with those who have registered so thank you for those of you who joined if you can't or cannot make it next week though but you want to stay in touch um, please do register and that way you'll be, be kept up to date with everything as always thank you for joining and uh, have a great afternoon thanks for joining this after this lunchtime and speak to you and see you next week thanks again Mick okay thanks John thanks everyone have a good day bye bye